Our speaker this afternoon is Ryan Hanley. He is an associate professor of political science at Marquette University. His research in the history of political philosophy focuses on the Scottish Enlightenment and Adam Smith in particular. His work on Smith includes Adam Smith and the Character of Virtue, Cambridge University Press 2009, and a series of articles that have appeared or are forthcoming in the American Political Science Review and the American Journal of Political Science and several other journals and edited volumes. He is also the editor of the Penguin Classic Edition, Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments, and the editor of the forthcoming Adam Smith, A Princeton Guide, um, the recent conclusion of his term as president of the International Adam Smith Society has afforded him an opportunity to finish his current project, Love's Enlightenment, a study of love and the political and moral philosophy of Hume, Smith, Rousseau, and Kant. So please join me in welcoming Ryan Hanley. Uh, thanks very much, Don, for that kind introduction. And uh, even more generally, uh, I'm sure I speak for everybody when I say that we'd like to thank you uh, for organizing this wonderful event. This has really been a treat, and I know that uh, not just the panelists, but also the uh, the attendees uh, seem to have been uh, quite, a, it's been a very enjoyable experience all the way through. So perhaps even since I get the bad clean up here, can we give Don a quick can here? <laughs> Um, I am very pleased and very honored to be here uh, joining you. And I wanted to spend the afternoon saying a few words about Smith's thoughts on religion, which is a topic that hasn't come up much in our discussion so far, but turns out to be an uh, area of fairly flourishing inquiry among Smith's specialists and recent scholarship. So what exactly is it that's attracted recent students of religion to Smith? It seems to me that much of the recent scholarly commentary has tended to center on three specific questions. First and foremost is the question of Smith's own personal beliefs. In this vein, a number of prominent recent biographies, including the excellent uh, biography by Nicholas Philipson, which I would recommend uh, if you were looking to read one piece of additional literature on Smith, I think it's a wonderful overview. Uh, but Philipson's and others have uh, sought to reopen the question of Smith's alleged atheism and the degree to which he was corrupted or, if you prefer, enlightened by his friend Hume. Uh, second and close behind in these three topics of inquiry is the question of the substantive role of commitments characteristic of natural religion in uh, Smith's ethics and economics. And third, in addition to his personal beliefs, natural religion, third is the question of Smith's attitude towards revealed religion, and especially his conception of the way in which he sought to mitigate through his various institutional proposals what he saw as the most pernicious practical effects of institutionalized forms of revealed religion. So taken all together, all of these studies have done much to illuminate the centrality of religion in Smith's thought. But it seems to me that they've nevertheless left quite unexplored to what is, to my mind, Smith's most interesting and I think most important contribution to thinking about religion, namely his theory of what he himself calls the, quote, natural principles of religion. Uh, Smith invokes this concept uh, in the conclusion of his most explicit and extended treatment of religion in the theory of moral sentiments. And this comes in book three, chapter five, which is dedicated to a study, as Smith titles it, quote, of the influence and authority of the general rules of morality and that they are justly regarded as the laws of the deity. Now, so far as I know, this chapter has yet to receive any systematic treatment. And thus my primary aim over the next half hour or so is to try to reconstruct its argument and thereby shed, light on, uh, shed some light on what exactly Smith meant by the natural principles of religion and thereby hopefully uh, open up um, something of a discussion on his understanding of the relationship of religion and morality more generally. So to that end, to give away the game at the outset, uh, in what follows I want to argue for three specific claims uh, each of which concerns how we ought to understand Smith's concept of the natural principles of religion. Uh, first and foremost, Smith used the concept of the natural principles of religion to distinguish those forms of religion which serve to promote and privilege morality over ceremony. In this respect, his invocation of the natural principles of religion in TMS 3.5, together with his critique of quote-unquote false religion in the chapter that follows, TMS 3.6, 
Mark Smith as an important, if largely overlooked, contributor to the Enlightenment debate on the nature of what was then called, quote unquote, true religion. In this sense, then, the natural principles of religion stand as the opposite of corrupt forms of religion. But Smith also sees the natural principles of religion as natural in a second sense. That's the second claim that I want to argue for, namely that he regarded the natural principles of religion as natural also insofar as they serve to reinforce what Smith sees as our natural inclination to respect and reverence the general principles on which society is built. In this sense, the natural principles of religion form a key bridge between our moral psychology and the institutions that Smith conceives as necessary to preserve human society. Third and finally, Smith also regarded the natural principles of religion as natural in another and very different sense. For not only does he view these natural principles as reinforcing our natural inclination to duty, but he also sees them as reinforcing our natural sentiments of justice. On this front, one of Smith's most important claims in this chapter is that our attraction to religion owes much to our recognition of the disparity between what we naturally think the morally worthy deserve and the way in which rewards in fact tend to be distributed in the world. In this sense, religion serves to buttress what Smith calls those quote unquote natural sentiments that incline us to reward virtue and to punish vice. So taken all together then, Smith regards, I think, the natural principles of religion as natural in three discrete senses. First, natural insofar as they've not yet been corrupted. Second, natural insofar as they reinforce our natural sense of duty. And third, natural insofar as they support our natural love of virtue. Smith's theory of the natural principles of religion is thus, I think, subtle and sophisticated and goes well beyond what one might have originally expected. On its face, and particularly given the intimate and well-known association of Smith with Hume, it's tempting to assume that Smith's natural principles of religion are something akin to either the natural religion that Hume critiques in the dialogues or the natural history of religion that Hume explicates in the book of that title. Without denying that Smith was in fact deeply influenced by these two concepts, what follows aims at a very different end, namely to demonstrate the striking degree to which Adam Smith thought religion to be natural to human beings. A conviction, I think, that crucially distances Smith from the way in which Hume thought about religion and, in fact, brings him very close to the position on religion defined by Kant. Now, with that in place, let's turn to the text here. So, as I mentioned at the start, Smith's invocation of the natural principles of religion comes at the conclusion of dis his discussion in TMS 3.5, and it's there that I'd like to begin. In the final paragraph of this chapter, and in the context of explaining the degree to which piety ought to be construed as evidence of morality, Smith explains, and here I'll quote, wherever the natural principles of religion are not corrupted by the factious and party zeal of some worthless cabal, wherever the first duty which it requires is to fulfill all the obligations of morality, wherever men are not taught to regard frivolous observances as more immediate duties of religion than acts of justice and beneficence, and to imagine that by sacrifices and ceremonies and vain supplications, they can bargain with the deity for fraud and perfidy and violence. The world unju undoubtedly judges right in this respect and justly places a double confidence in the rectitude of the religious man's behavior." End of quote. That's uh, a long passage, but I hope you'll indulge me here. It's uh, from TMS 3513. Now, I go through this quote because I think two claims in this uh, important passage deserve particular notice. The first concerns the immediate point of comparison for the natural principles of religion. Here Smith has explicitly contrasted religious, religion's natural principles with the factious and party zeal by which its natural principles are, as he says, quote unquote, corrupted. So indeed, whatever else these natural principles of religion may be, they are clearly the inverse of those sectarian politicizations of religion that Smith here and elsewhere finds so troubling. So readers of the Wealth of Nations will know Smith's arguments on this front from his critique of Hume's proposal for state establishment of religion in Wealth of Nations 5 and his own counterproposal of a freedom of religion that would encourage a, quote, great multitude of religious sects 
and thus foster, quote, philosophical good temper and moderation, a proposal we now know inspired the famous defense of political pluralism set forth in Federalist 10 by James Madison. So in this sense, Smith's contrast of the natural principles of religion with the corrupt religions of the cabals here in TMS anticipates his later contrast in the wealth of nations between the religious, uh, religions of the zealous and what he will there call, quote, that pure and rational religion, free from every mixture of absurdity, imposture, or fanaticism, such as wise men in all ages of the world wish to see established, end quote. Now, this concluding paragraph of TMS 3.5, though, uh, quoted uh, a few minutes ago, also contains a second distinction. The natural principles of religion are to be distinguished not only from the religion of the zealous or enthusiastic, but also to be distinguished from the religion of the superstitious. Thus, Smith's insistence that the fundamental distinction between the natural principles of religion and the corrupt religions is that where adherents of the former principally aim, quote, to fulfill all the obligations of morality and especially of, quote, justice and beneficence, Adherents of the latter privilege, quote unquote, frivolous observances and sacrifices, ceremonies, vain supplications as more immediate duties. So in this sense, the natural principles of religion clearly privilege moral duty over ceremony. Religious principles are thus natural, first and foremost, precisely insofar as they promote a morality built on natural sentiments. Smith develops his discussion, uh, his, this claim in his discussion of false religion in the chapter that follows. Here, describing the ways in which the central characters in Voltaire's Mahomet were corrupted by, quote, the strongest motives of a false religion, Smith argues, quote, false notions of religion are almost the only causes which can occasion any very gross perversion of our natural sentiments, end quote. So Smith's claim here that the natural principles of religion support moral duty to the same degree that false notions of religion corrupt it, thus I think importantly binds Smith's theory of the natural principles of religion to the concept of quote unquote true religion developed separately by Hume, by Rousseau, and by Kant, each of whom very explicitly defines true religion as that religion that privileges performance of moral duty over religious ceremony. Now, with that in place, we can turn to a second side of Smith's natural principles of religion. So far, Smith's discussion is focused on the contrast between morality and ceremony. But even if this helps us see what the natural principles of religion are not, it does little to help us define what they in fact are. What then exactly is the quote unquote morality that the natural principles of religion support? Smith gives an indication of what he has in mind on this front at the beginning of the paragraph in which he invokes the natural principles of religion. That paragraph, which is TMS 3513, begins with the claim that, quote, religion enforces the natural sense of duty, end quote. Now, this is a key claim, for here, and I think, lies a second way in which religion's natural principles are natural. Specifically, the natural principles of religion are natural, insofar as they reinforce the, quote, natural sense of duty. Now, with this, though, comes uh, a new question, or perhaps several new questions. First, what exactly does Smith mean by duty? And second, how exactly does Smith think that religion, quote, unquote, enforces our natural sense of duty? To answer these questions, I think we have to turn from the end of the chapter to the beginning. In the first line of TMS 3.5, Smith introduces the claim that organizes the entirety of his treatment of religion in the chapter. Quote, the regard to those general rules of conduct is what is properly called a sense of duty, a principle of the greatest consequence in human life and the only principle by which the bulk of mankind are capable of directing their actions, end quote. Now, I think a great deal of work is being done in this opening sentence. First, Smith here explicitly defines what he means by duty. In his words, duty is a regard to society's quote unquote general rules of conduct. Second, he calls prominent attention to the significance of this regard, distinguishing it almost hyperbolically as quote, a principle of the greatest consequence in human life, unquote. And third, Smith emphasizes the scope of this principle of duty 
calling it the only principle that is capable of directing the quote-unquote bulk of mankind to morality. Each of these claims is quite central to his treatment of religion, I think deserves a little additional scrutiny. To that end, I want to start with Smith's claim regarding the significance of the natural sense of duty as a quote-unquote principle of the greatest consequence in human life. What exactly does Smith mean by this? In the paragraph that follows, he explains with reference to the general rules of civility and hospitality that in fact, quote, that habitual reverence which your former experience has taught you for these enables you to act upon all such occasions with nearly equal propriety and hinders those inequalities of temper to which all men are subject from influencing your conduct in any very sensible degree. But if without regard to these general rules, even the duties of politeness, which are so easily observed and which one can scarce have any motive to violate, would yet be so frequently violated, what would become of the duties of justice, of truth, of chastity, of fidelity, which it is often so difficult to observe and which there may be so many strong motives to violate? But upon the tolerable observance of these duties depends the very existence of human society, which would crumble into nothing if mankind were not generally impressed with a reverence for those important rules of conduct. Again, I apologize for the long quote, but a lot of work is being done here, I think. Uh, and that's from TMS 352. Um, in this long quote, I think it's almost impossible not to be struck by Smith's almost breathless language. His claim is that duty is not a mere matter of speculation, but one of existential concern, insofar as the quote-unquote very existence of society depends upon it. Now, Smith's locution here will remind specialist readers of the TMS of his earlier warning that without a respect for justice, the quote, immense fabric of human society necessarily must in a moment crumble into atoms, end quote. Now, in both places, this is a striking claim. But while scholars have rightly and frequently emphasized the significance of Smith's claim regarding justice, his parallel claim that we're looking at here with regard to moral duty has been largely neglected. Yet Smith seems as sincere here as he is there in the justice passage in claiming that the very preservation of human society depends upon the performance of moral duty and indeed on the fact of our quote unquote reverence for duty, a claim central to the treatment of religion that follows. But even before Smith turns directly to this treatment, he introduces a new question, namely that concerning who is meant to feel this reverence so seemingly indispensable to society's preservation. Smith's treatment of this question in these passages speaks to one of the most contentious elements in recent interpretations of his thought. It was once widely held that Smith defended a two-level moral system, reserving virtue for the few and propriety for the many. More recently, although not without debate, as several of our panelists earlier today have noted, it's come to be generally held that Smith is more egalitarian than such a position would seem to allow room for. Now, this debate is important for our treatment of duty here, since several passages in TMS 3.5 have figured prominently in this debate. Some would seem to play into the hands of the inegalitarian view, including his opening claim, already referenced, that duty is, quote, the only principle by which the bulk of mankind are capable of directing their actions, end quote, as well as Smith's explicit distinction later in the paragraph between, quote, the coarse clay of which the bulk of mankind are formed and what he calls, quote, those of the happiest mold. Yet, elsewhere in these same passages, Smith sharply qualifies this seemingly inegalitarian view insisting that, in fact, the principle of duty is necessary for all of us. Hence, Smith's claim that, in fact, quote, there is scarce any man, end quote, who cannot be led to virtue by dutiful regard for general rules, and his even more sweeping claim that just after that, quote, that without this re sacred regard to general rules, there is no man whose conduct can be much depended upon, end quote. So taken together, then, Smith argues, one, that duty consists in regard for society's general rules. Two, that a reverence for duty is indispensable to society's preservation. And three, that such a reverence is universally necessary. It's with that in place that he then turns directly to the place of religion in all of this. His general intention here is to show that religion works with nature 
to encourage in us a quote-unquote reverence for the general rules of society. Religion, he particularly argues, is uniquely able to establish certain forms of incentives that usefully structure our motivations in ways that further the ends of human society. In this vein, Smith particularly emphasizes how the religious man, quote, never acts deliberately, but as in the presence of that great superior who is finally to recompense him according to his deeds, end quote. Here and elsewhere, Smith suggests that religion encourages behavior in accord with our natural sense of duty, specifically by positing the existence of a deity who will reward the just and punish the unjust in an afterlife. Religion transforms mere respect for general rules in this way into the quote-unquote reverence and appreciation of quote-unquote sacredness needed for mere respect to become a governing principle of conduct. Thus his claim that quote, when the general rules which determine the merit and demerit of actions come thus to be regarded as the laws of an all-powerful being who watches over our conduct, and who in a life to come will reward the observance and punish the breach of them, they necessarily acquire a new sacredness from this consideration." End quote. In this way, religion joins to our natural sense of duty what Smith calls the quote-unquote strongest motives of self-interest, the uh, quote, the idea that however we may escape the observation of man or be placed above the reach of human punishment, yet we are always acting under the eye and exposed to the punishment of God, the great avenger of injustice. This is a motive capable of restraining the most headstrong passions." End quote. Now, this relatively easily grasped point about God's vengeance can obscure two other more subtle points that Smith, I think, is also making here about the ways in which religion is natural. First, Smith regards nat religion as natural on the grounds that it confirms what he calls our quote-unquote natural hopes and fears. For evidence of this, he turns to the natural history of religion, that is, the way in which religious belief is, as he says, first impressed by nature. In this vein, Smith explains, quote, men naturally are led to ascribe to those mysterious beings, whatever they are, which happen in any country to be the objects of religious fear, all their own sentiments and passions, end quote. Now, on its face, it might seem as if by this, Smith merely intends to expose the arbitrariness of all such attempts to anthropomorphize the deity in, quote, the ignorance and darkness of pagan superstition, end quote. And to some degree, this is clearly right. Like Hume, Smith was consistently skeptical of our capacity to generate epistemically verifiable ideas of the divine. At the same time, even in developing this claim, it was hardly Smith's intent to expose the arbitrariness of religion across the board. For even if our conception of the divine must necessarily be artificial and arbitrary, given the limits of human epistemic capacities, this idea itself Smith regarded as the direct expression of our natures. It's in this sense that he repeatedly insists in this passage that we are, quote unquote, naturally led to create the ideas of divinity, that such ideas are indeed, quote unquote, impressed by nature, and that these ideas are in fact the extension of the, quote unquote, natural hopes and fears of human beings. Thus, even if the specific content of certain religious ideas must necessarily be seen as arbitrary, Smith clearly thinks that the existence of such ideas is the direct consequence of certain principles of our natures. So, Smith's brief history of pagan religion here thus helps clarify the first way in which he thinks religion deserves to be regarded as natural. But he also thinks that religion, and indeed a more sophisticated version of religion, is natural in another sense. For if pagan religion is best regarded as the emanation of our quote unquote natural hopes and fears, Smith also thinks that a more advanced religion is itself the result of quote, the governing principles of human nature. To illustrate this, he turns from rude religion to civilized religion, or specifically that religion that emerges after the dawn of what he calls the age of artificial reasoning and philosophy. Like the first religions, this religion too is founded on the belief in a deity that rewards and punishes, and which, as Smith says, thereby, quote, confirmed those original anticipations of nature, end quote. And here I'm going to give uh, yet another somewhat longish quote, this time from TMS 357. Quote, the happiness of mankind, as well as of all other rational creatures, 
seems to have been the original purpose intended by the author of nature when he brought them into existence. No other end seems worthy of that supreme wisdom and divine benignity which we necessarily subscribe to him, ascribe to him. But by acting according to the dictates of our moral faculties, we necessarily pursue the most effectual means for promoting the happiness of mankind, and may therefore be said, in some sense, to cooperate with the deity, and to advance as far as is in our power the plan of providence. By acting otherwise, on the contrary, we seem to obstruct in some measure the scheme which the author of nature has declared for the happiness and perfection of the world, and to declare ourselves, if I may say so, in some measure the enemies of God. Hence, we are naturally encouraged to hope for his extraordinary favor and reward in the one case, and dread his vengeance and punishment in the other." End quote. So, just as rude religion's beliefs are intended to confirm our natural hopes and fears, philosophical religion likewise is born in the fact that we are, as Smith says, quote unquote, naturally encouraged to hope that God will reward and not punish us. So, on the basis of what I've tried to argue thus far, I think we can conclude that Smith thought religion natural to man insofar as it coincides with our natural hopes and fears and thereby confirms our natural sense of duty. But Smith also considers religion to be natural to us in a further way. And explicating this further sense is the task of the second half of TMS 3.5. Smith begins this discussion by picking, a theme that he picking up a theme that he introduced in the chapter's first half namely the way in which the world rewards virtue. The thrust of this discussion is that virtue tends to be rewarded in the world in accord with deserts. In this sense, Smith observes that, quote, if we consider the general rules by which external prosperity and adversity are commonly distributed in this life, we shall find that notwithstanding the disorder in which all things appear to be in this world, yet even here, every virtue naturally meets with its proper reward with the recompense which is most fit to encourage and promote it." End quote. Now this is a familiar observation, and it would seem to confirm a view of Smith as a theorist of ordered design. Yet here, as elsewhere, the full story turns out to be much more complex. As Smith goes on to explain, there's a tension here that suggests the world may be considerably less orderly than we might have wished. For even if the ways in which, quote, prosperity and adversity are commonly distributed, appear just when considered in this quote-unquote cool and philosophical light, the actual allocations often stand in tension with the sort of judgments of merit and demerit prompted by our quote-unquote natural sentiments. And it's precisely this disjunction, Smith thinks, that renders religion necessary and constitutes his second and I think most important argument for religion's naturalness. Smith introduces this discussion with a specific example meant to illustrate the divide between the way in which the world distributes its rewards and the way in which our natural sentiments lead us to wish these rewards would be distributed. Thus he explains, quote, the industrious knave cultivates the soil, the indolent good man leaves it uncultivated. Who ought to reap the harvest? Who starve and who live in plenty? The natural course of things decides it in favor of the knave the natural sentiments of mankind in favor of the man of virtue." End quote. Nature, on some very basic level, clearly turns out to be a much more complex concept than we might have expected. Natural processes lead to a result the opposite of that which our natural sentiments would wish to see. Yet it's precisely this gap between natural processes and natural sentiments that renders religion necessary and natural in this fundamental sense. For as Smith goes on to explain, our natural sentiments, when confronted with the spectacle of the way in which the world rewards the vicious but hard working and neglects the virtuous but less industrious, prompt us to exert ourselves to remedy this seeming injustice. In a remarkable locution, Smith thus claims that, quote, man is by nature directed to correct in some measure that distribution of things which she herself would otherwise have made, end quote. Put slightly differently and a bit more bluntly, we are by nature strompted, prompted to strive to correct nature. Now it seems to me that this line is especially important. As others have shown, Smith here renders it impossible to ascribe to him any naive faith in unregulated invisible hands that can or ought to be trusted to distribute goods in the world. 
But for our purposes here, the significance of this claim lies not in how it informs our understanding of Smith's positions on spontaneous order and distribution in the free market, but rather how it informs his understanding of religion. For it's precisely the fact that our natural sentiments prompt us to strive to correct the ways in which goods are distributed by nature that leads us to religion. Quote, and this is uh, TMS 3510. But though man is thus employed to alter that distribution of things which natural events would make if left to themselves, though, like the gods of the poets, he is perpetually interposing by extraordinary means in favor of virtue and in opposition to vice, and, like them, endeavors to turn away the arrow that's aimed at the head of the righteous, but to accelerate the sword of destruction that is lifted up against the wicked. Yet he is by no means able to render the fortune of either quite suitable to his own sentiments and wishes. The natural course of things cannot be entirely controlled by the impotent endeavors of man. The current is too rapid and too strong for him to stop it." End quote, again from TMS 3510. So here, and it seems to me, lies the key fact. Our natural sentiments prompt us to struggle to remedy the defects in the way rewards are distributed in the quote unquote natural course of things. Yet our boundless indignation at this phenomenon far outpaces our comparatively weak capacities to address it. And this recognition that it is quote unquote out of our power to redress the seemingly unjust distributions of nature leaves us in a decidedly uncomfortable psychological position. Seething, the, seething with quote unquote indignation and quote unquote furious resentment at the spoils garnered by the, ver, by the vicious and despairing with quote sorrow and compassion for the sufferings of the innocent, end quote. We thus seem to be left in a precarious state. The brute fact of the clash between our natural sentiments and the natural course of things coupled with the consciousness of our utter powerlessness to resolve this clash necessarily leaves us, quote, grieved and enraged, end quote. Where then to turn? Interestingly, the answer to this clash between natural sentiments and the natural course of things lies in yet another prompting of nature. And here's the last long quote to which I'll subject you, TMS 3510. Quote, when we thus despair of finding any force on earth which can check the triumph of injustice, we naturally appeal to heaven and hope that the great author of our nature will himself execute hereafter what all the principles which he has given us for the direction of our conduct prompt us to attempt even here, that he will complete the plan which he himself has thus taught us to begin and will in a life to come render to everyone according to the works which he has performed in the world. And thus we are led to the belief in a future state, not only by the weaknesses, by the hopes and fears of human nature, but by the noblest and best principles which belong to it, by the love of virtue and by the abhorrence of vice and injustice." End of quote. Here then, I think, lies a second way in which Smith regards religion then as natural to man. The gap between our natural sentiments and the natural course of things leads us, we are here told, to quote unquote, naturally appeal to heaven. In this sense, religion is natural, not only insofar as it reaffirms our natural hopes and fears, as Smith showed in the first part of the chapter, but also insofar as it gratifies our natural love of virtue, a love that in fact can only be gratified in a world that operates under conditions quite different from those of our mortal life. So with this in place, I think it's safe to conclude uh, that Smith in, thought, in fact thought religion natural to human beings. But this prompts the question with which I'd like to conclude, namely, why exactly does this matter? I think it in fact matters, and indeed matters a great deal, for two very specific reasons. The first concerns how we ought to understand Smith and the place of religion in his thought. As noted at the outset, the question of Smith's views on religion has been of great interest to a number of recent scholars. Yet this debate, whether it concerns the question of his personal beliefs, that of the substantive role of natural religion in his thought, or that of his attitudes towards revealed religion, this debate has largely been dominated heretofore by a binary of theism and atheism. But it seems to me, based on the reading of Smith's uh, own most extensive discussion of religion, as given in TMS 3.5, that Smith himself understood religion in a very different light. The question that matters for him with regard to religion was that religious belief is both natural and necessary for human beings, 
as a consequence of the way in which our natures and the nature of the world have been fashioned. And this brings us to the second reason why I think Smith's thoughts on religion are significant. This concerns how we ought to position Smith vis-a-vis -vis the understanding of religion uh, advanced by his contemporaries. Uh, as I noted at the outset, several recent students of Smith, and especially those who have tended to find in his thought evidence of irreligion, have argued that his conception of religion is fundamentally Humean. But this, I think, is a mistake. For regard, with regard to the question about religion that most mattered to Smith, namely the question as to whether religion is natural or unnatural to man, Smith's conclusion is the direct opposite of Hume's. In the introduction to his natural history of religion, Hume set forth the central question to which his book is dedicated, as well as his answer to it. The question at issue, Hume explains, concerns, quote, religion's origin in human nature, end quote. And Hume makes a very strong statement as to where he stands on this question. On the grounds that belief in religion seems not to be universal, Hume concludes, quote, it would appear, therefore, that this preconception, that is religion, springs not from an original instinct or primary impression of nature, and that instead, quote, the first religious principles must be secondary, such as may easily be perverted by various accidents and causes, end quote. But it's this very claim, so dear to Hume, that I think Smith explicitly rejects. Thus, however much other aspects of Smith's treatment of religion appear to be or actually were borrowed from Hume, many of which have been very brilliantly uh, explicated by Spencer Pack in his 1995 article, it must never be forgotten that for all of these debts, the entire thrust of Smith's most explicit and extended treatment of religion in the TMS is dedicated to demonstrating precisely what Hume is most concerned to deny, namely that religion is in fact natural to human beings. And this then brings me to the point on which I'd like to close. Smith's defense of the claim that religion is natural to man not only distances him from Hume, but I think importantly and interestingly anticipates Kant. In full consciousness that this is a conference on Smith and not Kant, uh, I will keep these last remarks very brief and only call attention very quickly to four specific fronts on which Smith's understanding of religion anticipates Kant's. First, Smith's distinction between the natural principles of religion and the religion that privileges ceremony over moral duty anticipates Kant's own central distinction between the quote-unquote religion of rogation or the quote-unquote religion of divine service on the one hand and what Kant identifies as the true quote moral religion or religion of good life conduct on the other. Second, Smith's claim that religion first emerges as a way of enforcing our natural sense of duty anticipates Kant's own definition of religion as, quote, the recognition of all our duties as divine commands, end quote. Third, Smith's insistence that religion reinforces this natural sense of duty by heightening our, quote, unquote, reverence for the general rules of society and rendering them, quote, unquote, sacred to us, interestingly anticipates Kant's theory of how what he calls true religion heightens respect or reverence or achtung for both the moral law and for the duties that follow from it. Fourth and finally, Smith's claim that religion is natural is, as we've seen, in large part a claim that religion is necessary, a claim that anticipates perhaps the most important element of Kant's theory of religion, namely that religion, while not the ground of our maxims, must be embraced as, quote unquote, a necessary consequence of the concept of the highest good, and in this sense, quote unquote, meets our highest, our, meets our natural need. Put differently, what really concerns Smith with regard to religion are not the sort of questions that Hume asked about what we can legitimately infer concerning the existence or attributes of God. That is, the sorts of questions that Kant and Smith both dismiss as unanswerable matters of quote unquote speculative cognition. But rather, what matters to Smith is Kant's key insistence that insofar as it is our duty to promote the highest good, it is quote unquote practically necessary, as Kant says, to quote unquote assume or quote-unquote, presuppose the existence of God. In the end, I strongly suspect that a faithful adherent of Smith's natural principles of religion would be prepared to say precisely what Kant's upright man says. Quote, I will that there be a God, that my existence in this world be also an existence in a pure world of the understanding beyond natural connections, and finally, that my duration be endless. I stand by this without paying attention to rationalizations, however little I may be able to answer them or oppose them with others more plausible, and I will not let this belief be taken from me." End quote. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, I mean, for me, it raises some of the question, so, so how exactly do you link the issue of propriety versus virtue? Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems to be the concern with the compatibility of virtue and reward, not the issue of propriety and reward. So market economy would be compatible with uh, balancing propriety, proper behavior and reward, but not virtue and reward. So why should we be so concerned that virtue is rewarded rather than propriety? I mean, I mean, virtue is something that is, in some sense, not to be, exp that goes beyond the expected, right? Uh, why should that push us to believe in God? I mean, Kant, it's actually clear, right? It's moral behavior as not something that is, for Kant, duty to fulfill your duty is not something that's admirable. It's just something that is to be expected from all rational human beings. But because it is to be expected from all rational human beings, uh, we then would like it also to be rewarded. Now in Smith it doesn't seem as if virtue is to be expected from all human beings, right? So why should we bother with thinking that the virtuous person needs to be rewarded rather than the person who is doing what is to be expected from everybody? Right. So virtue seems to be something that goes beyond the expected instrument. I mean, am I right? I mean, just yeah, there's, there's several things on the table here. I might qualify slightly the distinction between propriety and virtue. Because the, Smith does think that virtue tends to be rewarded in the world, a virtue of one very particular sort. The first virtue that he discusses in the character of virtue, which is not propriety per se, but prudence. And so, so this makes more complex the separation of the two. So the real question is that the prudent are rewarded in the world, but those who exhibit other virtues, uh, and in particular the virtues of self-command, of, uh, of uh, tremendous, uh, universal beneficence, et cetera, et cetera, these are the ones who are not meeting with uh, what we might on uh, instinctively, as Smith says, by our natural sentiments, be inclined to think are their natural and so then the question becomes, what solace ought they to take? And uh, as a basic matter of phenomenology, my, I think that Smith is probably right when he describes that uh, uh, the instinctive feeling that we have when we see the industrious name rewarded and the, uh, the indolent, virtuous uh, uh, human being uh, less rewarded. And the question becomes, um, what does one do with that psychological tension? And I think that it's in that framework and not the framework simply of uh, virtue or propriety that Smith is interested in religion. Smith is interested in these natural principles of religion as a psychological response. And I think that's important for several reasons, because one of the questions that necessarily uh, I'll ask myself, uh, well, actually, maybe I'll hold on that because I'll see if somebody else asks. But um, maybe I'll do full stop there and say that um, it's for those um, supererogatory virtues beyond prudence that are not rewarded in the world that makes virtue that makes religion necessary from the standpoint of psychology principally. Um, if I could follow up on that, what I was thinking when you were describing that, and earlier when you were speaking that. Is it safe to say that it's really about justice, then? It, it supports a psychological belief in the justice of the system so that people know if you're not rewarded now, you'll be rewarded later. And that I was wondering if that linked to what Maria was saying about trust being a proxy for, um, for morality, that there, there needs to be, that it would support a commercial society in that respect, that it would just increase the level of trust in, in the justice of 
the overall system, even if in particular instances you couldn't quite see, you know, if, if the rewards actually, you know, matched up with, with what was deserved. So I'm wondering if, if justice is the, the broader virtue that he's interested in here. Yeah, no, I like the locution that is it about justice, and I would say absolutely, and indeed on several different fronts. I, I mean, in one sense, religion is all about justice insofar as Smith details, not just in that path, those passages from 3.5, but elsewhere, that um, uh, there's a certain practically salutary uh, form of religious belief that is simply good to have in polities. I won't go so far as to say that he is Rousseau and social contract 4.8, but he takes, he goes a very long step down the line to describe the essential dogmas of what Rousseau thinks of the civil religion, defending especially the, uh, the, the um, practical utility of belief in an afterlife and in a God that punishes. Those things, and rewards, those things are good for justice here on earth. But there's also, and that's the sort of obvious crude sense in which uh, religion is all about justice. But there's another sense that I do think is uh, important to bring out here, that um, insofar as justice, maybe I could put it in a different way. There's one psychological uh, experience that gives rise to two very interesting phenomena. The psychological experience is that of resentment. Resentment is what lies at the heart of justice. He's very explicit about this. And actually, we, oh, uh, again, mentioned uh, another excellent article by Spencer Pack and Eric Schleser, in which they've traced out very helpfully how, uh, quite frankly, uh, our instinct of justice is born in our natural instinct to resentment when we see an innocent other in so that's an important thing, number one. But it does seem to me that he's getting exactly the analogous description of the other institution that comes from resentment, which is religion itself. And so in this sense, religion, I'm not sure how far I want to push this, but it seems to me that uh, on some level, the form of justice that he wishes to encourage is the social institution that comes from, uh, uh, from uh, resentment, just as the um, individual institution that comes from resentment is religion understood in the course of its natural principles. I didn't say that as clearly as I wanted, but I think the key thing is that um, it's all about justice, but in these two discrete senses, one of which is obvious and takes us back to social religion, the other is in this less obvious, but I think uh, psychologically sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really elegant paper. I enjoyed that very much. And had not thought about the passages seriously at all, I think. Um, I, Hume offered a simple argument, and I couldn't figure out what Smith's response was. So the simple argument was, religion's not universal. Um, if it's not universal, that means it's not a fundamental impulse, it's a secondary impulse. And I couldn't tell whether on your reading, Smith's reaction to that is to deny the premise and claim that it is universal, or to claim that uh, it's not universal, but everywhere it's not found, that's a perversion, just the way some religions are perversions of the natural principles of religion, lack of religion might be. Um, those seemed like the two possibilities, but given how you set things up, but it seemed also open to him to say, in the sense I mean natural, that it's not universal doesn't show it's not natural. Mm -hmm. And so I see three possible positions, and I, I missed how, what Smith's was. I think, given that schema, I would say two. <laughs> the second. In that order, so the second, which oh. is Smith would not deny, in fact, I think he'd be in full agreement uh, on the fact that uh, religious observation is not a universal phenomenon. Smith is reading a lot of everything from the travel laws of Native North Americans to the Chinese, and there's lots of suggestions, and I think he's as persuaded by Hume by that. Then the question becomes what one does with that, and I think that his emphasis on the language of the quote unquote corruption of the natural principle. I think his suggestion, he doesn't go quite so explicitly to say this, but I think where he wants to push back on Hume is to say that we can't take the uh, failure of some to exhibit religion as indicative of anything other than corruption, if that makes sense. 
So he, he wants to make uh, some suggestion that these are exceptions to what the natural rule would be. Does he, and so what would the argument be that, say, the whole Chinese population was corrupted? Does he have a thesis about the source of the corruption qua corruption? Uh -huh. um, yes, it's in the okay. I'm not sure. uh, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about Smith on China, and uh, my uh, project tonight is going to review the proofs of the boyfriend and article on this. Uh, Smith is fascinated by the way in which the Mandarins have corrupted the Chinese in a variety of different ways. Maria, in her talk earlier today, mentioned the drowning of the babies like puppies. So practically, they have done very bad things in right. the political economy, and there seems to be also some suggestion that certain of these principles were less sanitary on philosophical and theological grounds, too. Okay. Interesting. Cool. I might just sort of follow up a bit on that question, because it was, it was sort of my question. Um, so, so you mentioned the sort of two stages of religion, the primitive religion and then religion affected by philosophy. But what, so what, what would Smith say about you know, the, that, that second step comes with something else, which is philosophical irreligion, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Epicurus and uh, that. So how does Smith explain those guys, are they just, they're just mistaken um, about their own lives, or? Um, it's hard to argue from silence, since Smith doesn't give us a disposition yeah. on that there's a dog for what you're saying like that. Um, It seems that when he praises certain figures, as philosophical figures, ones that have achieved a certain level of psychological wholeness, that um, some belief in the transcendence is an important part of that. So we can point to a couple of things he says about different Stoics, even though he, I would not want to say he himself endorses the Stoics. What he has to say about, um, I think, one of the most interesting but neglected passages in the entire TMS is this passage on the ancient eclectic philosophers, which he puts next to Hutchinson. He seems to admire them tremendously, and part of it has to do with their relationship to the transcendent. Smith is playing a very dangerous game, though, which should also be said, because he's not simply putting together a hierarchy. Those like those nasty materialists who don't believe in God should be there, and all those others who do believe in God up there. He's not nearly so reductionist. He's playing a dangerous scheme that he's well aware of, I think, because he takes seriously Hume's objection to knowing God in some fixed sense. When I men mentioned that sort of epistemically verifiable, those sorts of questions about the nature and the attributes of, uh, of God. Smith, I think, is sold on Hume's skeptical argument. Those things can't be known. But yet, he seems to admire certain kinds of figures that operate outside of simply the question of knowability and are still oriented by a certain question that goes even beyond the threshold. And this is why I think Smith, this is a longer discussion, but picks up on other aspects of Hume's naturalism as a remedy for certain of these skeptical, skeptical worries. So uh, does he ever come out forthrightly and say, uh, what should we do uh, with philosophical pure religion? No. But he does seem to be worried about the phenomenon. And maybe the best evidence would be the very fact that even as Hume entrusted him to publish the dialogues concerning natural religion and named him as will as the executor to do this, Smith refused and refused to have any part in that. Uh, he doesn't seem to have been, well, but he doesn't seem to have wanted through his actions to align himself with uh, those who would wish to spread philosophy. Now, unfortunately, he gets the worst of both worlds because uh, he still got fired by all those uh, on his death that, that accused him of being an accomplice and corrupted by them. It's a long, 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 I'm a little confused about how Smith would handle the problem of the divergence between the course of nature on the one hand 
that rewards the knave and so forth, just the rewards the knave, but, um, and then the course of the moral sentiments on the other hand that wants to correct the course of nature, um, because the former would seem to be guided by God, right? That seems to be the invisible hand, presumably on even this sort of moral religion of Smith's. Um, a believer in that would have to say that the course of nature is part of God's design. It's not, there's not a separate thing called nature doing its thing and then God over here doing, making sure that effort and virtue match up. Yeah, so you've got these two seemingly not harmonized aspects of things. Um, the course of nature, invisible hand, its distributive effects on the one hand, and then the human sentiments which react with a kind of anger at the way things are getting distributed and you know, take steps to try to implement it. And um, that's, religiously speaking, as it were, theologically speaking, that seems very confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and does Smith just overlook that or does he have something to say about that or how does the confusion fit into his theory or, or why is it written out of it or if it is written out of it? Yeah, so yeah. I agree that it's confusing if the point of departure is granted that the invisible hand is in fact the hand of God. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm yet persuaded that that's in fact the case, of course. No. It's certainly the case that he recommends a number of institutions, at least around the margins, perhaps more centrally, if you start to others with the interpretation of the political but he subscribes to certain uh, interventions and institutions that will either undo or try to correct practical natural processes as a matter of this political time. But he never would frame those, and rightly so, as going against God's order. Mm -hmm. It's not that building I don't know, canals and bridges would, would hardly be a sin against God. It would sort of be incomprehensible from that perspective. Yeah. So that leads me to think that that first principle, that perhaps, I don't want to necessarily wade into these waters because I don't have as much of a dog on the side as others do, but I'm inclined to think that the invisible hand is something uh, that uh, there's a lot of theological resonance, but I don't think that there's ultimately serious theology behind it. Yeah. But I mean, I, I agree, but it's strange because the way you've, I think, actually rightly interpreted it. Smith is left with a picture in which, you know, um, we're, we're by nature encouraged to certain kind of religious views. These, these views are particularly helpful in reinforcing our moral sentiments. These moral sentiments lead us on occasion to object to the way that nature, um, the benevolent hand of nature, <laughs> um, distributes things. And so a belief in God helps us to correct the way in which the world works naturally. So a natural belief in God helps us to correct the natural course of the world. I mean, religiously and theologically, that would be a quite confusing picture. I mean, it's not that it corrects the course of the way. It, nothing actually happens in the world. Once you believe, yeah. it's not as if all of a sudden justice now is done to those out there. It's yeah. the fact that, yeah, I don't want to put it so strong, but I think that somehow you're now able to withstand the psychological discord that comes from realizing that nothing you can do will ever put things right. Right. So it's not a correction of what's actually happening. Mm. It's simply a, how does one want to say, it? some sort of self fortifying uh, mechanism by which one can sit with the, is this is work, injustices. Yeah. Well, I'll just end by saying I'm not sure how successful a moral religion this really is then. It seems very unkantian like in that the backup that you're getting from the religious credo is faced with a kind of a standing, um, you know, um, a standing objection to it, which is, the way things actually work. Mm -hmm. So we're left with the hopes, but we're it's being demonstrated to us simultaneously that the hopes are empty, that they won't be realized. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how moral is that? How much of a moral backup is that? Mm -hmm. I think Smith's sketch is really very paradoxical. I agree that it's paradoxical, yeah. but I think that's what makes it profoundly Kantian. Uh, the, the fact, uh, the necessary belief in the highest good yeah. is a belief that is necessary even though we know it won't be realized here on Earth. That's precisely what has to lead us into the possibility of the afterlife. I mean, this is just straight end of second repeat, right? Uh, very perpetual peace will never be realized here on Earth. Again, mm -hmm. it's our duty to act as if it may be possible for that to be realized. So, um, yes, I agree that there are sort of empirical challenges mm -hmm. here on the table in terms of how.
how it fits the justice that we would wish to see. But that doesn't, if anything, that strengthens the motivation or the necessity of having a police presence in day to Okay. Thanks. Just actually uh, a few uh, questions uh, following up. I mean, in Kant, it seems to be a postulate of practical reason. Uh, if I understood your answer to Denise right, in, in Smith, it's more resentment. So Nietzsche's right, it's all slave morality. But if you compare his answer to Hume, it can't just be resentment. It must be resentment from the impartial spectator perspective because otherwise he couldn't really criticize the Chinese, et cetera, et cetera, as not feeling that kind of resentment. They just don't feel it. But they actually should feel it if he is right. So, so he actually needs to appeal to the impartial spectator perspective. And then I'm just wondering, now, I understand his critique of Stoicism where he says that, oh, I, I, I just do have to feel certain attachment to my family. The Stoics are wrong about that, that we should treat them in the same way. But why not just say, this is the course of the world. Mm. Accept it. Uh, take a kind of Zen attitude towards it. Uh, don't feel bad about it. You can't change it. Uh, God has nothing to do with it. That's it. I mean, so, so if, if religion is not a universal phenomenon, then I'm not sure that, I mean, for him it's a kind of almost prescriptive belief. Now Kant gets it in by saying it's a demand of practical reason itself that has to do with the completeness of the goal that we are attempting to achieve. So there's a kind of rationality behind it. But in Smith, it seems to be, if, if I understood you right, it would be the justification of a certain kind of resentment from the impartial spectator perspective, and that's difficult, I would guess. It could, uh, if I could disaggregate the two aspects of that and the second first, which is the question of why bring God into it? Why not just sit with it, don't worry, be happy, sort of? <laughs> Smith certainly talks in that way, especially in fact when he talks about certain ancient philosophers as having that available. What he seems to be perpetually worried about is what are the sort of, uh, what, what sorts of beliefs must one subscribe to in order to be able to sit with that in any sort of real or perpetual way. So you mentioned being fluently Zen. You're not Zen unless you have come to very, very serious beliefs about nothing that's in the core of one's own. And um, if, if there are people out there that are wondering how much Smith and Hume had access to turns out that while Hume was at the flesh, he was actually, uh, right in the first book of his, walking around taking long walks with the Jesuits who actually knew more about Buddhism than anybody else. So uh, when he talks about uh, the no self, or when, when Hume talks about the problems of personal identity and stability over time, uh, I think it's, 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 I'm not the one that stood out and got the answer on this, but I think very persuasive that there's some chance that there's Buddhism there. But that's Hume. I don't think that's Smith. I think for Smith, that sort of root for example, underpinnings of sitting with that disjunction isn't available. And I think that he's consistently pointing in a theistic direction because uh, that is the underpinning necessary to be able to be sort of Zen in that sense. Uh, the other passage where this comes out is the anxiety that uh, many people know this passage, the, the uh, horrific possibility and the psychological disjunctive possibility of the thought of a fatherless world. This would be another place where that comes from. Um, on the first question, the first question on resentment, I need to think through this a little bit more because it seems to me that a lot of times the, the claim that you were making is that he needs to tie resentment to the impartial spectator in the case of China. No one's justified and unjustified. That seems right. But he continually appeals, especially when he describes resentment in the uh, religion places, as a phenomenon that is much more instinctive and much less cognitive. And it seems to be the sort of thing we see it, we feel it more human in that respect, rather than something that we put through the process of the judge. I don't deny that he might, one might need to go to that impartial spectator to make that resentment legitimate and to do some of the work that I'm describing, but I need to go back a little bit on this because it does
does seem that he's very insistent upon bringing out these sort of in, instinct is not his word, probably not the right word to use. The uh, sort of, uh, we see and feel. So if we could imagine a conversation between Karl Marx and Adam Smith, and Marx says, religion's the opiate of the masses. Uh -huh. How does Smith respond? Uh, you're, you're, I'm traumatized now because <laughs> I remember when I was a junior faculty member in the job market, facing <laughs> political theorists, potential unemployment, and started family here. And I went out and kind of got thought everything was going well. And then someone asked me, well, what did Adam Smith have to say to everything John Stuart Mill said? Very <laughs> 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 Uh, I'll try and be more quick right here. Um, there are ways to even spin parts of Smith's discussions of religion to suggest that, uh, taken out of context, these are things that look like mechanisms of social control along those same lines of both his natural or he's well aware, he knows his mind Valley very well, he understands this, this same sort of core principle. Uh, but I, I think it's important that when he treats religion, when he treats it in the wealth of nations, he treats it as a social institution. But when he treats it in the theory of moral sentiments, he treats it not as a social institution, but as a matter of individual psychology. So uh, one thing that one would need to do to develop this paper well, I think, would be to put this next to those discussions in Wealth of Nations 5 that have been referenced a little bit in our conference where he talks about what we need to do to mitigate the pernicious forms of sectarianism and such things. Uh, because that's where the, the, the sort of concerns for Marx and Machiavelli that might be, might be operable would be relevant. But he really does seem to be in a different mode in the same way that he's in a different mode across the theory of moral sentiments, in which it's agent principally person, person principally concerned, the individual that really is the locus of the analysis, a little bit different from the social frameworks uh, in which he does it. What would Smith say to Marx? Right? As soon as we have to have another conference, I think we get that fully out there. I don't know if I need to use the mic at all, but that seems to be the ritual here. Um, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. And I'm wondering if Smith if Smith's view of religion is that it is to encourage our reverence for duty and reverence for the general or rules of conduct, why should he be against religious ceremonies, which seem to be able to do the same, accomplish the same reverential effect, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and this is what the Chinese believe, that the rules of propriety are intimately bound up with morality. And it is through practicing those ritual proprieties that we become moral. Yeah, OK, good. There's a, uh, I wonder, that's great. Uh, there's three different things I'd like to say. Uh, one is, I think Smith understood well the attraction to and I think mostly for reasons that he's taken from Hume's epistemology. I'm dying, I'll make this confession here at Holy Cross, I'm dying to write a paper called David Hume Catholic because he gives all of the psychological motivations to explain why human beings might be attracted to or have predisposition to engage in ritual. That said, both Hume and explicitly Smith want to distance themselves from ritual understood as when ritual becomes an end in itself. So it is important that uh, his qualifier there, I believe it's, uh, he says, quote, unquote, vain ceremonies, which I take to be ceremonies in which simply the performance of the deed is seen as an end in itself rather than a serving of moral purpose. So I think that is something that actually would, uh, you can, I'm not going to go through the maps, but I can imagine disaggregating certain uh, religious practices or, or most likely Catholic practices uh, that would serve those ends and others that wouldn't serve those ends. But I think we'd have to, we'd have to sort of take a scalpel and look at them individually and see whether they serve larger moral ends. On the Chinese case, um, yeah, 
the, the creation faith in Smith's time was, uh, the, 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 so the question is whether Confucianism is a religion, of course, and the big debate is because of their uh, ancestor piety ceremonies, are these specifically religious ceremonies or not? And Smith had a number of books in his library which talked about the great side use of these insofar as they promoted intergenerational uh, ties, uh, reverence for ancestors, uh, a certain familiar piety, which is very desirable. That doesn't really, Smith never himself comments on this directly, but one can imagine both religious as well as non-religious uh, institutions provided that they were further these moral ends that he would be friendly for. I wish I had, we just had a scrap of paper that uh, would tell us what he really thinks about the, the Confucian ancestors in this way, but um, I can imagine him being quite friendly towards certain non-religious uh, ceremonies he doesn't go, again, quite as far as Rousseau and sort of acting and praising and trying to encourage the establishment of these, but within his framework, I think, even being friendly, that provided that they serve an identifiable uh, moral as you're serving uh, public duty. Okay, cool. Please join me in thanking Ryan for